So when Jesus leans in and the disciples lean in to listen to this talk, he compares the righteousness of the Pharisees to the righteousness of the kingdom in regards to relationship. Jesus knows relationships are significant because, first of all, we were made for relationships. You and I were made for relationships. Genesis 2.18, we find this in the creation. God created you and I as relational beings because God is a social being in, within the Trinity. And we were created in the image of God. The first time the Bible ever mentions that God intervenes with his creation, with humanity, what is it that God does with Adam? He adds another human being to the equation. Because everything about creation would signify how that we are relational beings and we were divined, we were divinely created to live and operate in a healthy way within the construct and the context of relationships. Later, Jesus would go on in, in, in Mark chapter 12 when asked, which is the greatest of all the commandments? Remember, when the lawyer asked Jesus, which are the greatest of all the commandments? He was speaking to not just the Ten Commandments. Remember, there were 603 other commandments, laws. There were the Ten Commandments and 603, there were 613 laws within the Old Testament. And when the lawyer asked Jesus, of all the 613, which would be the greatest? And Jesus responds by saying, and he is leaning into the significance of, that everything about God operating in your life in a healthy way has to do with relationship. Because Jesus said you can take all the 613 and you can bring them within two, and it's simply this, love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. So here's what Jesus was, this is what Jesus was laying at a foundation when Jesus responds to the lawyer. Relationships are of the highest value to God because this is the context and the design in which you and I were created because Jesus knows this truth. He knew that you and I, our relationship with God and our relationship with others will last into eternity. So therefore, Jesus says, I'm going to talk to you about the most significant thing there is within your life. We were made for relationships. Say that with me. I was made for relationships. Nothing is more important than relationships. Say that. Here's this. Relationships bring growth and change into our lives. There's a, there's a great proverb, Proverbs 27 17 that says iron sharpens iron and so a friend sharpens a friend this highlights the importance of relationship it's as though God is saying I compel you to be within relationships watch this where sparks fly and you know that Often in life, what we do, and I may hit this a little bit next week, but in the, the context of relationships, we, live, we typically live to two extremes. We live to the avoidance category where I isolate and I don't need anybody, or I have to have everybody in order for me to be fulfilled. And what Jesus wants to do is he wants to bring you and I to a calibrated balance, to where we live within a healthy place of what relationships should mean to us. Iron sharpens our iron. iron relationships, friendships, they sharpen us. What they do is they cause you and I to grow. Look over to the person sitting beside you today and say, God might have just put you here. Go ahead and tell them. God just might have put you here to help me grow. Don't you feel better? You're like, I don't even know who this is. <laughs> I know that was uncomfortable for you. <laughs> Could I say this to you? You and I, and for anyone that's been married for any period of time, 
you're going to understand the statement that I'm getting ready to make. You and I will never be able to get married to a fully sanctified spouse. Y'all want to go ahead and have an altar call and wrap this thing up and go on? <laughs> right? You will never have a friend that will be so mature in the friendship that you don't have something that you have to work through and navigate through. I will never live close to a neighbor where I'm ultimately free from all conflict. And parents, I hate to disappoint you, but you will never have self-parenting children. It just doesn't happen. Because everything about life is about relationships and it's about growth and it's about development. So Jesus starts with the subject of relationships. And here's what he's really wanting to do. He takes the analogy in the Sermon on the Mount of the righteousness of the religious leaders to the righteousness of the kingdom of God, and he wants to compare the righteousness. So this is why you'll hear Jesus, not just in the Sermon on the Mount, but often throughout his teachings, he will say, as you've read, we're getting ready to see this, you've heard it said this way, but I tell it to you this way. Now what is he doing? Jesus is saying, where I come from, I'm the king. And in the kingdom, where I come from, we do things differently than you do here on earth. So what Jesus was saying is, you've heard it said about relationships, and you watch through dysfunction on earth that they're done this way. But where I come from as the king, and in my kingdom, we do it a different way. Now why is that so important for you to understand? Because remember, unlearning something, is way more challenging than learning something. And much of my life and your life and all of our lives together will be spent unlearning things that Jesus said, I need to teach you a new way. A new way to see, a new way to think, a new way to love, a new way to interact. So Jesus leans into the context of relationships and um Look where he starts. He starts with the old friend conflict. So he starts right out of the gate. I mean, it's as though, <laughs> I think it's all intentional from Jesus. When I go back and read the Sermon on the Mount, not individually in chapters, but if you just read it straight through, he is setting this whole conversation up. He starts and he pulls the listeners in with the Beatitudes and says, would you like to be happy? Everybody wants to be happy. So he lays out the statements. And he says, the kind of person that experiences that type of happiness, your influence and impact, your salt and light, you're going to change the world. All of his listeners are leaning in, and then he goes in for the hard conversation. And could I say to you, for the next few weeks as we teach, if you're like me, you're like, like Dr. Um, Martin Lloyd-Jones, one of the great writers of another day, said that every time he read the Sermon on the Mount, it crushed him. It crushed him to come to the reality that the standard in which Jesus said we are to live is completely impossible within our own ability. It must rest upon the grace, right, and the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives. We can't accomplish this. When you hear what Jesus is going to say today, you're going to say this is impossible. And Jesus is going to say that's exactly right within yourself. But within grace and my presence, all things are possible. Amen? With the grace and presence of Jesus Christ, how many would agree? All things are possible. Let's put our hands together and give him an expression of thanks for grace. For grace. So he leans into conflict. You've heard, you've heard that it was said. So here he is. You've learned it this way. I'm going to talk to you about conflict this way. People long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, even if you have an angry thought and a brother or sister, then you're subject to judgment. So Jesus uses the religious leaders and their righteousness 
who would have stood up and said, I've never murdered anyone. And Jesus would have said, great job. That's a good boy. But that doesn't say anything truly about your heart. Jesus then would go and say, even if you have a thought that is angry in the word in the translation used here, in the original translation would mean this. If you have a thought about someone else that would diminish their value to a person of emptiness and nothing, you're in danger of judgment yourself. So what Jesus is doing is Jesus is going deeper to the underpinnings of the heart. And he is saying, let's talk about real kingdom righteousness. Because self-righteousness and to just live by the letter of the law was, I've never murdered anyone. So therefore, I'm elevated to another position above other people. And now I've assumed the role of judge. And in my elevated position, I get to judge other relationships. And Jesus said that at its root is basically pride and contempt. In conflict, did you know most research would show that often conflict in its root is connected to pride and pride would be to elevate yourself to any degree above someone else and assume I know what is right more than they do. Pride, contempt. You know, most, rela uh, most relational issues where there's a uh, conflict start with a hurt. They start with hurt. Um, unresolved hurt, and Jesus knew this in the heart of people, unresolved hurt becomes infected and it's very easy for my heart and your heart to become infected when we're hurt by an individual and a relational being my heart can become toxified i can become injured i can become infected and here's the thing if you and in this passage jesus goes on to say even if you had the thought of somebody else that you're elevated above them and they're nothing compared to you you're in judgment, and you're just as guilty as the person who took a life and murdered. And then Jesus goes on in a few moments, and he says, settle matters quickly. There's the cliff notes to survive your marriage, right there. Settle matters quickly. Could I get an amen in the room? I mean, settle them quick. There's something about settling matters quickly. Because listen, you and I can manage one hurt. To manage two offenses becomes extremely difficult. To manage three, when you start holding on the three offenses, your emotions pull out the journal and you start comparing notes of anger and resentment and judgment and how you're right and they're wrong. So Jesus said, settle matters quickly. How, how important was it to Jesus regarding conflict? Matthew 5, 23. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, he's talking about going to church. If you're at church and you're getting ready to listen to Pastor Logan talk about generosity and giving and you're getting ready to give your gift and it comes to your mind that you had a conflict with somebody else, and you have not went back and resolved the conflict, you know how important this is to God? He says, stop with the giving and go get that thing settled because what you're doing through the giving is saying everything with me and God is right, and God is saying, no, if there's unbroken damage in consistent relationships as a pattern with you in your life, you can't look at that and say things are right with God. God says, go make things right with people, and that's part of what changes this relationship for us with God. Do you see the significance of what he's saying? Listen to Paul David Tripp's writing about relations. We often think that if God really cared for us, he would make our relationships easier. 
I actually thought about not adding that to my notes today because I thought it would get that very response. (laughs) You know that your spouse's greatest gift to you is sanctification. (laughs) Can I get an amen? In reality, a difficult relationship is a mark of his love and care. Have you ever thought about it that way? We would prefer that God would just change the person, but he won't be content to change simply the person unless he changes you as well. This is how God created relationships to function. What happens in the messiness of relationships is in our, is this, that our hearts are revealed, our weaknesses are exposed, and we start to come to the end of ourselves. See, Jesus leans in and says, if you want to talk about the righteousness of religious leaders and self-righteousness, we could do do that all day long. We could sit and compare notes that I haven't lied, I haven't murdered, I haven't done these things. But Jesus says, that really doesn't tell me anything about your heart. If I really want to know what's going on in your heart, I'm going to look to the underpinnings of your deep core being. And I want to see, are there unresolved issues in there in which you are holding bitterness, resentment, unforgiveness? Come on, somebody. How many knows that every now and then, because of hurt, we all are guilty of taking someone down into the little torture chamber of our hearts? Oh, really? Oh, so you don't do that? That's just your pastor? Well, that's a horrible thing to think you're led by a pastor that does those sort of things. Is it just me or anybody else has ever taken somebody down into the little torture chamber of your heart and you tortured them there a while and convinced God what they deserved and how they needed to be treated? Listen, Jesus says, that's where I'm going because I want to clean that up and I want to set you free from that. Because that's poison and that's toxin and that's only going to destroy your future relationships. The health and maturity of relationships are not measured by the absence of problems. But by the way inevitably that we respond to the problem. So conflict that is there, Jesus says, I really know what's going on in the heart when I now begin to see how you and I respond to conflict. Then he goes in deeper. You know, I'm, I'm just imagining the listeners. I imagine, especially after watching The Chosen, I just imagine these disciples looking at one another and being like, seriously? How is this possible? And then he goes deeper. He goes to commitment. He goes to marriage. He talks about the issues of sex. Now look what he says. You have heard it. Once again, he says, I'm the king, and where I come from in the kingdom about relationship and intimacy, you've heard it this way, but I'm getting ready to tell you there's a different way. I tell you that if anyone even looks upon a woman lustfully, already has committed adultery because a self-righteous religious leader would have lifted their hand, the same ones that would have said, I've never murdered anyone, would have stood up and said, I've never committed adultery, and Jesus would say, that's a good boy. Give him a hand. Because Jesus would say, even though that you have not been in the physical bed, you may have been in the mental bed. And that is just as wrong. So what Jesus lays out here before us is he starts talking about this whole context of what it means in valuing and honoring in commitment. You have to remember, a commitment alone within itself says nothing really truly about my heart. Um, Why is that? Because every day we make commitments out of what? Often, emotions. Here's the problem. Emotional commitments, we know by research, we know by our own lives, They don't last. A commitment is simply initiated out of an emotion. Show of hands, if you have ever made a commitment to a New Year resolution. 
Come on now, we're in church. You've got to be honest. Just go ahead and lift your hand. You'll feel better. I'll feel better. We'll all feel better. <laughs> it's out of an emotion. Something's going to change. And I'm going to get, I'm just telling you what I go through. I'm going to get serious about this health. I'm going to get serious about this. I'm going to get serious about my health. I'm going to get serious about my heart. I'm going to have a good cholesterol. Blood work this year until that Twinkie invades my space. <laughs> then I realize all my emotional commitment. Here's what I'm trying to say. The question's never about, please hear me on this, about commitment. The question is always, are you committed to a process? Ooh, that's good. It's not am I committed. I'm committed and married. Anyone can make a commitment at an altar in a moment. But can you be committed to the process of staying married? This is, this is where Jesus, he deeply goes into this context. And, and can I tell you, when it comes to the issue of sexuality, he begins to address the men here. And he addresses the men and he says, though you would say that you've never physically committed adultery, he would say, if you've allowed your desires in your mind to dishonor another human being, then in that moment, what you've went to and what you've done is you've diminished their value and the dignity of the human being. And though in a sense you haven't physically, what you've done in your mind is dehumanized and it is as deep of a heart problem as the person that literally and physically has done this. Then he goes on and he moves to the subject of divorce. This is, this is, a, this is a very, very complicated uh, talk when Jesus gets into this. As a matter of fact, later in, G in Matthew 19, 4, Jesus said, haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning, and by the way, could I say this? This is... Um, I'm always the person that feels like whoever designed something or wrote the book knows more about how it's supposed to operate. So <laughs> Jesus said, haven't you read that in the beginning the creator made male and female? And for this, and for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh and Jesus is speaking to the significance, listen to this, of a covenant relationship. And I don't have time today, but if we were to go into Scripture, we would look at things in terms of reasons to divorce, such as adultery. Another one, according to Paul, abandonment. I could show you these. Well, what Jesus is leaning into when he reads this passage here is the significance of of what a covenant would mean to come into a covenant with another individual. You have to remember when Jesus leans into this moment with the men that are listening regarding divorce, it was so complicated because in Jesus' day, in Jesus' culture, a man could request for a divorce at any time for any reason, according to the rabbis that would write. So Jesus is addressing the man that says, I can practice divorce and separate the covenant, this oath between God and myself and someone else, at any given time, over any reason, even though we intimately have already been in this place of covenant, Jesus is speaking to this very issue in this moment, and here's why he leans into it so strong. Because this was a recipe for abuse and oppression to women. And Jesus leans in and says, that's not the way the kingdom that comes from where I operate. We value one another and we value covenant. And we take this so serious in regards to, because why? Because covenant is a prearranged set of conditions designed by God in his creation for a healthy marriage. Both spouses do what in a covenant? What is it that happens? We rescind all rights. 
and then we accept all responsibilities. But see, we live in a culture and a day where we don't see marriage or family or those things in which God designed as covenant. We see it as contractual. And a contract is where both spouses keep as many rights as possible and they accept very little responsibilities. Do you see this? And Jesus leans in and says, that is not the way my kingdom operates. We don't remove ourselves. We don't take all the rights and give very few or hold on to very few responsibilities. In the kingdom, it's the complete opposite because there within the context, we learn to serve one another. Could I get an amen? And let me ask you, who demonstrated it best for us? Jesus himself through coming to serve humanity. He speaks to conflict. He leans into commitment. Then he goes into communication. Listen to what he says. You've heard it said, people long ago, don't break your oath, but fulfill what the Lord vows that you've made. But I tell you, don't even swear. Don't even swear at an oath and all, either by heaven or by God's throne. So he moves from, um, I'm talking to you about relational conflict. I'm going to talk to you about relational commitment because what I really want to know in your life is I want to know whether or not the underpinnings of your heart are really showing and pursuing the kingdom righteousness of what my kingdom represents. And he says, we're going to know this by the way we talk. Watch this. Did you know um, our words belong to the Lord? How many knows that? Did you know you and I are not the creation of language? God created language. Therefore, if God created language, then I'm using that which God has created. So my words don't belong to me. Jesus goes on to say, when it comes to words, words within themselves can create so many issues, conflict within themselves. Matthew 5, 37, all that you need to say is just yes or no. And anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Now, what is Jesus' suggestion, suggesting? Can you imagine what a marriage would look like if that's the only thing you said? Yes or no? Yes or no? This, <laughs> Jesus is not speaking to isolation or using that as a method to not deal with the emotions that are in your heart. Jesus is simply saying this about communication. Using or not using words in a misguided way can get you and I in a lot of trouble. This is what Jesus is speaking to. And here's the advice Jesus gives. Make your conversations clear, consistent, and concise. And you're gonna avoid a whole lot of trouble in your life. How many knows that we live in a world where people are wounded by words? And today it's not just, I mean, it's changed so much when I was young and when I was in school and I wanted to talk to Amy and tell her that I thought she looked pretty, I'd write her a note and pass it to her. Y'all remember those days? Amy has saved a suitcase. Oh no, don't say that. You don't want to read these letters. I can't even listen to the letters, I'm thinking about. But she saved all these love notes. Y'all remember the day, right? Well, we live in a different generation. You don't have to pass a letter today. We're tweeting and texting and emailing. And we don't realize it at times, but our words are nuclear. They are powerful, significant, changing environments. And Jesus comes in Matthew 5 and says, I need to speak to you about the carelessness, the carelessness of your words. And I want to talk to you about the significance in relationships of how to be careful with your words. But here's what Jesus was saying. Word problems really are heart problems. 
Matthew 6, 45. Out of the abundance of the heart, help me finish it, Christ followers, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. See, my problem with words and your problems with words when it comes to relational dysfunction at times, and we've all been there, I'm growing through this as you're growing through it. It's actually not a vocabulary issue. It's not a skill issue, and it's not a timing issue. L listen, it's a heart issue. Have you ever said, oops, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say that. Show of hands if you've ever said it. Come on. Everyone look around the room. Look, look, look. They didn't say it about you. Just look, look. Look at all the hands. According to Jesus' teaching, you should have reversed it. You should have said, oops, I meant to say that. <laughs> According to what Jesus said, that thought, that attitude, that desire, that emotion, all of that's what came out of the heart. So it was there. Now, I don't want you to practice that after church. Oops, I meant to say that about you. I don't want you to. I don't want you to do that. I'm just trying to give the illustration that what Jesus is saying is our language and our words and the issue with words and vocabulary and division and divisiveness and pain and hurt and injury, all those things, he says, is deeply related to the what? Where's Jesus going with the entire Sermon on the Mount teaching? He's going under the surface to the underpinnings of the heart and kingdom righteousness. And Jesus is saying, your words reveal what's in your heart. So what do I need? If someone says, I need to work on my vocabulary. No, I need to work on my heart and the vocabulary will take care of itself. Amen? Is this helping anybody today? Three of you. All right. He goes on and he says, you've heard it said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. How many would love to come to that kind of church? <laughs> Would, wouldn't that be great? What would you think to come to a church with a bunch of blind, toothless people? <laughs> Nobody can smile. Nobody can see. Wouldn't you love to be in that small group? I'm so, I'm so glad he changed it. He said it's no longer eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth, but he calls us to a, diff a different, deeper level of love and how we live out relationships among one another. This is what I truly believe. In Jesus' mind, when he taught this to the disciples, in his mind, he knew that those that follow me are gonna have their darkest, deepest issues in their heart eventually transformed and changed to where they will act like me, they will think like me, they will talk like me, and they will respond in the way that I do.